Steve Wynn, welcome to 13 Action News. Thanks for coming on. Nice well, to see you, John. Let's talk about, uh, we're, a lot of things to talk about. Let's talk about the presidential race. It's on everybody's mind. Uh, are you all president? Is there a race going on? Yeah, there's, there's a race. You may have heard about it. You're all in for Trump. I actually have been uh, sort of in the middle. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very strong supporter of Senator, well, Congressman Hecht, I hope soon to be Senator Hecht. We'll talk about the Senate race, I promise. Let's talk about the presidential race. You know, I'm friendly with Donald for 30 years. We've known each other for 30 you years. You always friendly. No, Let's no look. not always. Okay. We, <clears throat> when um, he perceived me to be a, a, com a potential competitor the second time around, when I was first there, he wasn't there. Atlantic City we're talking about. Uh, yes. And then when it looked like I was coming back and we were going to build the marina project, he, uh, he wanted to oppose that development and it got pretty testy for a while. But it was business, you know, and you don't take that stuff too personally. So it was easy to, uh, it was easy to make, make up. And, you know, I've enjoyed uh, company with him socially with his, his very lovely wife, Melania who's a terrific kid. But you've come to his rallies too here. I, I remember, I think there was one over at Treasure I, I, Island. I yeah. went to the Victory Rally right. uh, at Phil Ruffin's invitation, right. the night of the Las Vegas uh, caucus, the Nevada caucus. And uh, he, he gave me a, a shout out. Uh, <laughs> you know, Donald Trump is a kind of guy who's, who has a lot of friends in New York and out in the West Coast. Uh, including Phil Ruffin and I here in Las Vegas. And he calls us and we talk about what's going on. He was self-funding and didn't want any money. And like most people, I've been watching the presidential race because so much is at stake in it, hoping that the conversation would get productive. And I, it's just started to get productive now, finally as we head into these last two months. In what way do you think it's gotten productive? The issues are getting more substantive. Instead of, uh, the, the personal attacks, the negative ads continue unabated, but we've got Donald Trump talking about specific things and economically clarifying positions. Uh, I'm waiting for Mrs. Clinton to do it, but I definitely, Want us to keep, want the the country to have a Republican Senate and a Republican House. Uh, the, the thing, John, the thing that eclipses the campaign is what is really going on in the USA. We know that we have a very restless, frustrated, anxious electorate, and everything that's been written and stuff you've written uh, is reflective of the the angst among the folks, to use O'Reilly's term. <laughs> now, why? Okay, national security, personal safety has become an issue in the last year as the uh, jihadi uh, threat has come home. But really, there's something much more profoundly going on. And it <clears throat> is the root cause of the entire issue of uh, polarization in America. And whether that polarization goes between Democrats and Republicans, blacks and whites, Hispanics, and it all boils down to one thing. The living standard of Americans is being eroded. Every single, single person in the country, without exception, is experiencing a reduction in their living standard if they get a paycheck, or if they earn money, or if they own an asset that's cash. We take in 3.1 trillion. It's just a quick description of America. We take in 3.1, we spend 3.7 trillion. That means there's a 600 billion, give or take 100, deficit. The government, at once a month, in a little office in the Treasury Department in downtown Washington, they have an auction. And they finance the United States government and all of its stuff. When they're short 600, that's 50 a month in new money, 1.65 billion a day in new money 
that the government has to create. And by creating money, we say they print it. Uh, it it's more than, than you know printing $100 bills. It's when the Fed buys the bonds from the Treasury Department to artificially depress the, co the, the price, the interest in America. But let me, let me just stop you for just one second, because you've been talking about this for a long time. In fact, when we talked about it a year ago, you talked about the same kind of thing. And I guess what I'm wondering is, what's different about the scenario you just painted and what's always gone on? And why do you continue not to believe in the recovery uh, uh, that, that a lot of metrics show is going on, the unemployment rate going down, uh, more, more people getting into the workforce? You just don't believe it's a real recovery still? What I'm describing to you, this increasing of the money supply, therefore the devaluation of the dollar being eroded steadily, is, is disconnected to the point you just made. If, if the paychecks of the people that are working is declining, if the deficit stays the same, then the, 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 the deterioration of the living standard of people. That's why Walmart costs more money. <clears throat> That's why sneakers cost more money. They're not more precious than they were before. It's because the dollar has gone down. Why has that happened, in your opinion? The deficit. It's very simple. When it, it, there are two things going on simultaneously. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm recovering from a little cold. <clears throat> Two things are going on simultaneously. We are financing 50 billion a month, printing money, increasing the money supply in order to cover the deficit. The more money that's outstanding, the less value each piece of paper, each paycheck is. It's, you know, before the recession, the euro was 85 cents on a dollar. It got up to a dollar 48. It's back to a dollar 10. Not because we're, we're better, it's because they started putting the money in Europe the same way we are. What's caused it though? What are the policies? Uh, I mean, you've been, you, you, you early in the Obama administration, you told me, I, I believe the phrase you used, you said this is the most anti-business administration that you've encountered essentially. You, do, you, do you still believe that? And I'm wondering what policies do you think have helped cause the problems that you're describing? We had a 3% three, 3 increase in taxes. Uh, for Obamacare. We've had a publication of 3% was added on to what everybody else was paying for Obamacare long before any benefits, real or imaginary, were even, even on, the, on the schedule. But the point that, that underlies my comment that this was a job-unfriendly presidency, and that is beyond a shadow of a doubt been established. The speed and the volume of regulations that have been published by this government, from the NLRB to the Fed to the Treasury to the EEOC to every aid, there are 465 agencies in America, in the government, 465, 4,150,000 employees, a million and a half are in uniform, <clears throat> but 2,650,000 of them are civilian employees. And they publish regulations at a rate, in a volume, a speed, historically unheard of. These regulations strangle and retard the formation of businesses. The burden, we know about the burden placed on business with the Affordable Care Act. 2,700 pages, something I know about of the single most ridiculous piece of legislation. A lot more people are insured because of the Affordable Care Act. You don't think that's a good thing? John, we can have a separate program about <laughs> what's wrong with the Affordable Care Act. But let me put it this way. The other shoe hasn't dropped yet. It was carefully designed so that the worst of it would occur after this election in November in 2017. You mean premium increases? <clears throat> you bet. And rather regulatory, there, there's a list of things that can happen in the Affordable Care Act that is as long as a road from here to LA. Look, everything that goes on these days, nobody's got the patience, even in a program like this, when you tell me there's no time limit, but Bernie Sanders and Hillary campaigned about, we got to get the load of student loans off the backs of these poor kids, as if some, some vicious predator had come and hurt them. 
what no one talked about, because this is not a soundbite, the student loans. Here's the truth. Prior to the Affordable Care Act, the Department of Education guaranteed the loans, and third-party people made the loans, measured the creditworthiness and the ability of people to pay it back and stuff like that. The government wanted to pass the Affordable Care Act, but they wanted to say, as you recall several years ago, that it was neutral, that it wouldn't impact the deficit to make it worse. And all the Republicans were against it, 100%, and the Democrats didn't have enough votes to do it. The Democrats were reluctant. A whole bunch of them were given Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi heartburn. They said, if there's going to be an increase in the deficit, we're, you know, the Republicans will, will skewer us on this. Well, they had to make sure. And when the, def the thing was designed, it turned out that it was $8 billion in the first 10 years additive to the deficit. Now, $8 billion to the deficit is not a big number when you're running $600 billion a year but in deficit, but it was a deficit increaser. So they had to find <clears throat> the $8 billion in 10 years that would make it neutral. So they could say whether it was true or not, at least they could, the, go the, uh, the government accounting office would rate it as neutral. They had to go looking for $8 billion. So you know what they did? <laughs> yeah, Bernie Sanders didn't talk about this, nor does Mrs. Clinton, nor does anybody else. Either they didn't know it, or they know it and they lie. The government decided to issue the student loans directly from the Department of Education. Eliminate the middleman, and since their cost of money is zero, they give a piece of paper to the Treasury, an IOU, they made the 650 basis points, the six and a half points of interest. They picked up the spread on the kids' loans, and that happened to be eight billion in 10 years. Right, but, but I guess what I'm wondering is. Uh, you, we, we gloss over that if the government had any real interest. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people who- would have passed the money on to the kids at cost. Uh, there's a lot of people who say when they talk about, Bernie Sanders was essentially for free education. Secretary Clinton has essentially said, well, not quite free, let's, let's do something about the loans that you just talked about, that that's just free money. I'll talk about free money during a campaign. You and I have been around long enough. We've heard politicians make these problems. But, but I guess what I'm, I'm wondering, Mr. Wynn, is that you still seem to be leaning, you said you want a Republican Senate, we're gonna to get to the Senate race in a moment, but you're leaning against Secretary Clinton. You're gonna support Donald Trump, are you not at some point? Probably, but I, I haven't done it yet. You haven't given him any money, just, just advice and counsel? That's all. Really? Yes. You haven't contributed any money in the presidential race to any of the PACs or anything like that yet? No. So okay, all my searching for the internet was not in vain. I thought I thought I couldn't find any. There really isn't any. I mean, I mean, you know, you know Trump pretty well. You know the criticisms of Trump. Uh, uh, you didn't meet. Uh, you told me you didn't even meet Hillary Clinton until last year when you had a dinner at your apartment with Bill Clinton, who you know very well. You know Trump. I know you're surprised by his rise. You and I have had these conversations before. Uh, do you think and that the big criticism of Donald Trump is that he's just not ready? He's not stable enough. He doesn't know policy enough. You know the guy really well. Is he ready to be president? Oh, he's stable enough. Donald <clears throat> is a intelligent guy. There, there, there seems to be a, a, a thing about him getting in front of a crowd and which he gets uh, aggressive and, and sometimes his speech is, uh, you know, he shoots from the hip. Privately, he's thoughtful. And that's the reason he's been successful. And he is successful. I mean, you know, I remember Ivanka was staying at the hotel while they were building the, the Trump building that he and Phil Ruffin did across the street from the wind. And Ivanka was staying in the hotel all the time. And several of my employees made a point of telling me, because they knew I knew Donald, what an incredibly elegant and polite and graceful gal this, this woman was. Well, you know, I've got daughters, he's got daughters. I called him up and said, you ought to be proud of your daughter. Boy, has she made a great impression around the hotel. And I said, a half a dozen of my people, or maybe more, have told me how lovely she is and how grateful and polite She's, she's quite something. Four days later, I get a letter from Ivanka saying, oh, Mr. Wynn, apparently you must have called my dad 
but he came to my office and made a fuss over me. It was quite wonderful. You didn't have to do that. Thank you. Well, in a, in a subsequent conversation, I asked uh, Janine Pirro, who's on television as Judge Janine on Fox. Right. Her husband was Trump's lawyer for years, and she traveled with the Trumps while the children were young, growing up. And she told me that the disciplinarian and the real influence on the children's lives was Donald, week in and week out as they were growing up. And if you take a look at those kids, that really tells you something about the man. So you're saying he's much different in private. He's saying, you're saying he's a performer at those rallies. Don't you think he said some things? I think he's a performer at the rallies, and I think he hasn't quite, you know, got his act down. Uh, but in a, in a personal conversation about any substantive issue, Donald Trump is focused and uh, intelligent. This business of being a politician and getting into the, the razzmatazz of public debates and public speeches, I think it's a heady business. And, you know, he's been a real estate guy. It's all about his one-on-one -on -one contacts with people and his vision of understanding the future. And on that point, he's a much stronger guy than he appears to be when in these, in the, during the primary season especially, he was rambunctious. Why, why haven't you supported him then? Because you know this other side of him. You think that this criticism well, of him is unfair then, well, probably. Well, I, I don't think of this whole business of the election in terms of personalities. I'm thinking in terms of the election of what is, what is doing damage to my employees. Look, every benefit that I've received in, in life, and the only reason you asked me to come over here is because of the success my businesses have had and that is due to the employees, the 12,000 or 13,000 people that work for me in Las Vegas and the 30-odd thousand that work for me at the Mirage Resorts. I am very much aware of the condition of my employees because I know that when they're, when they're in a great frame of mind, when they feel safe, secure, and happy, then they pass all that joyfulness and that positive energy on to my guests. And that's the reason the place has a franchise. So I'm HR sensitive, and I know what's going on with my employees, and I know what's going on in America. And unless the living standard of Americans is improved, this kind of frustration and anxiety that's erupting in many ways in this country is going to get worse. But I don't understand. That still doesn't explain why you haven't supported Trump yet. You, you obviously like him better. I'm looking for a discussion in the public forum that's focused on the issue of the day that we can't owe 21 or 22 or 23 trillion, which is where we're headed. We can't really increase the money supply by 50 billion a month and have people stay calm. They're gonna get steamed and they're gonna bitch in a hundred different ways. And, and if it's the lower end of the economic spectrum, which unfortunately is the African American community, they're gonna be more anxious and, and, and more disruptive than they were before in their frustration. And people are going to begin to look for excuses like uh, we got to be against uh, the, the, the immigration is out of control. Well, the fact of the fact that immigration has been out of control for a while is no surprise to anybody. But the reaction to immigration is again part of the problem of the economic dislocation of people's lives. But Trump's tapped into that, that's for sure, and he did during the problem. But don't you think he's done it in language, Mr. Wynn, that, is, that, is, that, that should disturb some people? Look, if things are awry, if things are screwed up, and some comes along that says so, I don't think it's really very important on how good his rhetoric is. If he's a rough-talking businessman, so what? The question is, what's he going to do about it? What's he really saying? The, the language he uses, you know, uh, some of my friends tend to use more profanity than others. Uh, some of my friends are more bombastic than others. But what, what do they stand for substantively? But you're, you talk about your employees, and, and you're, you're coming at this whole economic question through the eyes of your employees, because you've done all right. Your stock is now doing well. The company's doing pretty well. You're talking about the, your, the lives of your employees. You know a lot of your employees are Hispanics. Uh, who are, 2,000 of them. Yeah. They are, and they're members of the Culinary Union, which is very upset, very, very anti-Trump. Uh, they have a different perspective of him than you do. You understand that, right? Look, I think that there, there's 
too radically, or there's two major, there's a great division in America, and it looks like it's you're for this person or for that person. The division in America is far more complicated and has far more complex roots than the simplistic kind of points that you and I are making to each other. A real discussion of what's going on in America doesn't lend itself to a quick answer. For example, John, I mentioned the deficit. You know when the Treasury keeps interest rates artificially low. Normally, in this country, from all of the, the pension plans of unions and the 401k plans, there's a huge flow of money that's taken out of everybody's paycheck every month. <clears throat> like a river of money flows to professional managers in, in Wall Street. And that river flows, and the people that own the money, employees in the union and 401k plans, they really don't know where the money is going. They, they assign it to the stock market, to a manager. These managers have to invest that money. Now, usually they make a balance between the debt market and the equity market, stocks or bonds. When the Treasury <clears throat> depresses interest rates, then these, this, these money managers can't get the return by buying bonds and safe debt instruments so the money goes artificially into the stock market. So when the Treasury interferes with interest rates and the Fed, it causes a bubble because the stock market gets all of the institutional money and you get a bubble in the equity market and the Dow Jones goes to 18,000. Is it true that American firms all of a sudden are worth 20% more than they were two years ago or four years ago? No. Even when resorts? Look. You, 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 I can't jump around when I'm making a point. I, I want to explain to you that when the government's monetary and fiscal policy is screwed up, a whole bunch of things happen. So people that have their money in, the, in stocks and bonds, and stocks rather, that think they've made a lot of money, there's a bubble in the stock market. Yeah, I was just wondering if you're getting to that. By the Fed. You're saying that's happening again then? What? You think it's happening again that the stock market is artificially inflated? Remember what happened the last time? The stock market has absolutely been artificially supported yeah. by the depression of the bond market because that's where all the institution money is gone. If interest rates were normal and if they were being adjusted by market pressure, then interest rates would be higher. But the Fed doesn't want that because there's a trillion dollars of credit card debt out there. So what we've got is, is poor monetary and fiscal policy. Now, I'm not pointing the finger at Janet Yellen per, or, or per se. I'm saying that our government, Democrat and Republicans, have allowed things to go astray. And when I'm, I look at the presidential race, the congressional races and the Senate races, as a businessman and as a person who does understand the economy in America and who has the patience to go beyond sound bites, I'm looking for someone who's having a substantive conversation. Well, I think you'll acknowledge I'm letting you go way beyond sound bites. So we're having a conversation about this. And you did mention. It is nice, but most, most conversations on news, there's a three minute segment. And now we're going to post all of this online. People are going to be able to watch all of this. I promise you that. Um, let's talk about, you talk about the Republican Senate, and you alluded to, to, to Joe Hack. It's very, very important to you. Uh, uh, why? This is a perfect example. If someone gets elected to the Senate, they usually stay there for a long time. Incumbents have an enormous advantage. So now we're looking at a seat that's been occupied by Harry for a long time. And it's time for a new senator. Joe Heck, I, there's nothing wrong with Catherine Cortez, a nice lady. I knew her dad. Manny was a friend. But we're not talking about who's nice people. We're talking about who's the best candidate to be a senator. Joe Heck is an extraordinary, extraordinarily fine guy and qualified beyond a shadow of a doubt. Served in the service, he's a doctor, highly educated, knows about health services. He was an entrepreneur and a businessman and he served our country and then volunteered and went back to Iraq. He's an, he's an Eagle Scout kind of guy, a moderate Republican, very, very honest, straight-laced. You know, I'm, 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 I'm hoping that he wins. So naturally, I'm trying to help him. Joe, you, Congressman, you've got to be here for this meeting and that meeting. 
He said, Steve, I've got to be in Congress because it's in session. I made a deal with my constituents. Sure, I want to win the Senate race. And I know I'm not going to be a congressman after January. But as long as I represent my people, I got to be there to vote. And I, I wish I could go to this fundraiser in Dallas or I could be here for this or that meeting, but I'll be back the minute we're out of session. But while we're in session, I'm going to Washington. And I, I respect Joe for that kind of thinking. He's a high principled man with a very balanced view of what the problems are in America and at least with the energy and the understanding to do a better job. I guess what I'm wondering though is that uh, Heck obviously has a great resume that you just went through in terms of, of, of his service to our country and, and, and you believe he's a moderate Republican. We can argue about that. He's certainly not nearly as far right wing as the Democrats would paint him. There's no question about that. But is it just really, I mean, be honest here. I mean, is it really just more about him being a Republican or, or do you th honestly think that he's a better candidate for some reason than Catherine Cortez Masto? The answer to your question is I absolutely know he's a better candidate, but more importantly, John, you know that I've supported more Democrats than Republicans. You have. I'm a registered Democrat. I know that, yes. And I'm, but I consider myself an independent. I don't give a damn about party labels. I'm looking at the people. And incidentally, when there's a good one, grateful as hell that they're in public service. But you want a Republican Senate. Because I'm too lazy to do it. I'm too selfish. That's, that's very scary, the thought selfish. of you. The thought of you in public office is too scary for me to consider. I want my own life. I know, exactly. But seriously, you said you want a Republican Senate, so it does to some extent have something to do with, the Repub with him being a Republican, right? Because I think Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan together will address the problem. I don't think, I know they will. If they have a Republican in the White House, they will send legislation over there to come up with an alternative to the Affordable Care Act that will incentivize and reduce health care costs. You know, I said to Harry, I said to Harry Reid, Harry, we're buddies. You know, he stays in the hotel sometimes with Laundra when he's out of session. He stays in the hotel. And I don't bother him, you know, he's a guest and my friend. Harry, what happened to long distance charges when, when Vonage goes against Verizon and AT&T, long distance charges go down. What happens when Geico goes against Allstate and Progressive to car insurance and motorcycle insurance goes down? Why in 2,700 pages of that damn bill did you not address interstate advertising or the healthcare savings accounts? I mean, the fundamental mistakes are so outrageously simple.